You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in the nationalist news. These are a few highlights of the news today, Wednesday, the 20th of February. Ten illegal immigrants arrested in Brent raids. Prime Minister disturbed by threat to Chipping Norton Mosque. Met to prosecute genital mutilation flight bookers. Sweden to deport Iranian Christian. Islamic canine aversion forces child from late night bus. The Reverend West talking about Pope Benedict. It's the first Egyptian arrest warrant for contempt of Christianity. Libyan style democracy, two years without Gaddafi. Court upholds death sentences for seven Christians involved in Mohammed video. Thought for the day, why can't we be more nationalistic? And finally, shall I go or shall I stay? UK News. Ten illegal immigrants arrested in Brent raids. The Harrow Observer is reporting that UK border agency officers raided a three-bedroom flat in Wembley and detained ten Indian nationals. Four women and three men, aged 30 to 51, were held for overstaying their visas and are being detained pending their deportation. A family of three who overstayed their visas were detained but granted immigration bail while steps are taken to remove them at the earliest opportunity. A World Day comment, which is likely to be never since it's a 37-year-old man, a 26-year-old woman and their one-year-old child. I'm sure, because the child social services will see that our benefit system will take care of them, especially if they're claiming the child was born in the UK. Immigration Inspector Dick Stratton from the UK Border Agency is quoted as saying, My officers are carrying out operations like this almost every day, and more are planned. For those who are living and working in the country illegally, there is no hiding place. Our World Date writer went on to comment, Inspector Stratton can pull the other one. That makes another 10 down. Only 862,993 to go then. Off you all trot. Prime Minister disturbed by threat to Chipping Norton Mosque. David Cameron has said he is disturbed that Muslims were forced to abandon plans for a mosque in his constituency because racists threatened to burn it down. Perhaps Cameron should have considered the likely consequences before he decided to deliver that notorious speech attacking multiculturalism in Munich two years ago. Scotland calling Mr Bond Should Scotland vote for independence in 2014, the Scots will require their own secret intelligence services. Ministers and former intelligence officers are warning that an independent Scotland could not rely on intelligence sharing from Britain's security services. The strongest warning comes from Baroness Margaret Nita Ramsey, who says that the SNP needs to think again if it believes intelligence from MI6, MI5 and the UK's communications headquarters, GCHQ, would be shared. The Daily Mail has written that security analysts believe that such spymasters will target the brightest minds at St Andrews University, where Prince William and Kate Middleton studied for the James Bonds of the future. A World Date reporter comments, Och, aye, the new. Hmm. Met to prosecute genital mutilation flight bookers. People who book flights to send girls abroad for genital mutilation operations will face prosecution in a new Met attempt to bring offenders to justice. Scotland Yard chiefs say that parents, relatives and others who arrange transport and surgery will be targeted for criminal action as child abusers as detectives step up their efforts to combat the illegal practice. The police move was revealed as the parliamentary hearing was warned that large numbers of girls aged as young as six are being sent from London to Africa for genital surgery, which leaves them with painful and life-changing injuries. It came as the Met disclosed that it is close to bringing the first British prosecution for female genital mutilation after receiving nearly 150 reports of cases involving girls in the capital already cut or at risk of surgery. British cops will be allowed to confiscate material from journalists. In a worrying blow to press freedom, police are set to be given new powers to seize confidential material from journalists. The changes may also mean journalists will be forced to identify whistleblowers to the police. 
Critics said the Home Office proposals, which follow recommendations made by Lord Justice Leveson, would undermine investigative journalism and free speech. It is feared that the changes will remove legal protections for anyone who releases material to reporters unless journalists can show their source did not breach confidentiality or act illegally. A nationalist spokesman said, Although I personally have no time for the press, this does seem like the start of Big Brother and the end of freedom of speech for many. European News Sweden to deport Iranian Christian An Iranian Christian convert seeking asylum in Sweden reportedly faces imminent deportation to Iran. The reports say if he is deported, he could be subjected to danger by the Islamic regime's security forces. Reza Jabari, the Iranian citizen who has converted to Christianity, is in danger of being deported. According to Mahabat News, Reza Jabari, an Iranian Christian convert, submitted his asylum request to the Swedish Immigration Services in 2010, during a visit to the country. However, the Swedish Immigration Court and the Immigration Office rejected his asylum application. The reports indicate that his case has been rejected while evidence describes him as a person actively participating in church and evangelistic activities among Iranians. His activities include distribution of Bibles and sharing the Gospel. Currently, he participates in the choir at Tenster Church in Sweden. This news was also published on CBN blog. The CBN report said, Apparently, the court questioned the sincerity of Jabari's conversion and said he failed to convince them that his life would be in danger if he was sent back to Iran. This, despite assurances from Jabari's pastor that he has a deep-down Christian identity as much as I have. Islamic canine aversion forces child from late-night bus. The following article tells the story of a little Norwegian boy who was forced to get off a bus in the middle of nowhere because some men of foreign origin, among his fellow passengers, didn't like the fact he'd brought along his dog. Our Norwegian correspondent, The Observer, who translated the piece, has this to say about it. This article concerns an incident of Islamic dog aversion and the effect it is having in Norway at the moment. Who said that Islam isn't putting pressure on Norwegian values? This occurred 12 miles from the nearest town, which is a sparsely populated region of Norway. The translated article from Afton Bladet Boy with dog felt pressured to get off the bus. The men of foreign origin didn't appreciate that the boy had brought with him a dog on the replacement bus for the train. Eventually, the atmosphere got so heated that the boy felt pressured to get off along a deserted stretch of the road. On Saturday evening, just after 10pm, the young boy was on his way home to Stavanger. He was dropped off at the train station in Ergesund. The train was cancelled and a replacement bus service was organised. Normally dogs are not allowed on a bus, but an exception is made for replacement bus services whenever a train is cancelled. In those instances it's allowed, according to Dog Brecken from NSB, Norwegian State Railway. The driver confirmed that it was OK for the boy to bring along the small dog. Turn Suzanne Acre, the woman who dropped off the boy at the train station, says that they received a text message from the boy while they were driving home in their car. In the text messages, the boy told her that three men of foreign origin on the bus clearly resented the fact he brought a dog along. The boy says that one of the men went to the front of the bus and spoke to the driver. Another went up to the boy and asked him to get off the bus. If not, he would be beaten up, said Acri. According to the boy, he was told to get off the bus by the driver. He was dropped off somewhere between Helvik and Sirivag. NSB has a slightly different version. We've spoken to the driver who told us that the boy pressed the stop button and got off voluntarily, said Dagbrecken. Turn Susan Acri reacts strongly to what happened. She says that the boy sent her a text message asking if he could be picked up where he was. She said that it was a very scared kid who got into the car. He was cold and quiet and it was apparent the incident had a profound effect on him, said Acri. Dagbrecken from NSB says that if something occurred in the back of the bus, the driver must have missed it. Consequently, he doesn't know what went on between the passengers, but he accepts the driver's version of events and will therefore not offer an apology on behalf of NSB. A World at Eight writer commented, Did anyone really expect the driver to admit throwing a boy off the bus in the middle of nowhere because he was afraid of our cultural enrichers? Is it likely he didn't want to lose his job for racism or intolerance? Were there no other passengers? 
It is sad that more stories like this are not heard or reported, because this shows just how much enrichers respect any country or its people who take them in. That is, not at all. Give them an inch and they will take a mile. Now I hand you over to the Reverend Robert West for his Wednesday talk. The Pope Resigns Last week we were informed that Benedict XVI, Bishop of Rome and Supreme Pontiff, is to resign as the head of the Roman Catholic Church, the largest denomination of Christendom. Benedict cites, as his reason, his advanced age, being well stricken in years, so that he can no longer fulfil the arduous duties of his ecclesiastical office. Those duties are certainly heavy, even for a man in the prime of life, let alone for one in his declining years. Perhaps the Chinese and the North Koreans should take note. But Benedict, formerly known as Cardinal Ratzinger, is the first Pope to abdicate, if that is the right word, from the See of Peter since about 1416. That is, about 100 years before Professor and Doctor Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the castle door at Wittenberg and began what became the Protestant Reformation and the modern age. How times have changed in 600 years. The papacy still claims supremacy over all churches and sovereigns and now even claims infallibility in all matters of belief and behaviour when defining doctrine, but the reality of its legal power is much less than it was in those days before Dr. Luther pinned, or rather nailed, his points to the castle door at Wittenberg. We have Germany, or at least a German and a Saxon to boot, to thank for that. That must bring us down to earth with our own politicians. The English are supposed to be Anglo-Saxons. Our language certainly is Anglo-Saxon in its basic words and in its root grammatical structure. But how unlike are our politicians, both to the conscientious current Pope and the principled Dr. Luther? Benedict XVI is to be admired for his sense of duty and for the fact that he is putting his job first before himself. Not many men could do that. They hold on to power with every last breath that they have. Dr. Martin Luther put duty before himself as well. He was not afraid, or perhaps he was, to put principle before comfort, but he overcame his fears and ushered in the modern age of freedom of thought, religion, association and belief. Praise God for Martin Luther. I am a great fan of his. I have some of his works and have even read some of them. They are well worth reading. His German Bibel, I am told, is superb. And for those who speak or at least understand German, can be gotten from the Trinitarian Bible Society in London. There are two lessons our politicians can learn both from the Roman Pontiff and the Wittenberg Professor. One, from Dr. Luther, is that they should speak out when the need is for them so to do, and not just keep quiet for their own comfort. I cannot imagine Dr. Luther being quiet on either the abortion holocaust or homo wedlock, can you? If David Cameron were a 16th century poof or pope, facing Luther. His crown would surely topple. The second is that, like Benedict the Sixteenth, our politicians should do the honourable thing and get out of government when they are no longer up to it. Thank you so much, Reverend, for your very good input today. World News it's the first Egyptian arrest warrant for contempt of Christianity. Well, actually, a second. The Egyptian prosecutor general is summoning hardliner Salafi preacher Ahmed Mohammed Abdallah, known as Abu Islam, 
who is charged with contempt of religion. Nagid Gabriel, head of the Egyptian Federation for Human Rights, and activists have filed a complaint against Abu Islam, accusing him of calling Coptic women prostitutes. The complaint also said the country's cops are bitter over the absence of justice regarding contempt of Christianity, as Abu Islam appeared in scenes humiliating Christ and the Virgin Mary. It is requested that the preacher be brought to a speedy trial so that the cops feel they are equal citizens and that all religions are safeguarded. Abu Islam, owner of the private television channel Al Umar, recently said it was halal, permissible, to rape female protesters, charging him with the defamation of religion, an Al Arabiya correspondent reported. In a recent televised appearance, Abu Islam described Valentine's Day as an event for the Christians, a celebration for adultery and prostitution. He's already on trial for tearing up a Bible during a protest outside the American embassy in Cairo in September over a short film made in the United States that insulted the Prophet Muhammad. Egyptian law forbids insults against religion, allowing police in the past to arrest Shiite Muslims and Christians for alleged slights against Islam. Libyan-style democracy, two years without Gaddafi. Mass protests are sweeping across Libya as the country marks the second anniversary of the beginning of a civil war that ousted Muammar Gaddafi. Two years after the fall of the Gaddafi regime, a new constitution has yet to be drafted. The new authorities have obviously failed to maintain law and order. Crime is rampaging and popular discontent is on the rise. Prime Minister Ali Zidane shut the borders with neighbouring Egypt and Tunisia during the anniversary celebrations from February the 14th to the 18th as a security precaution. Airport security was tightened with many Western airlines suspending operations and Western governments warning their citizens to leave Benghazi due to the imminent threat of terrorist attacks. With anarchy and marauding flourishing in border areas where once strict law and order reigned under Gaddafi, most Libyans, particularly in the East, have been outraged by the authorities in action. In addition to local extremists and adventure seekers, terrorists of all sorts, including groups of jihadists from Mali, have been pouring in. The democracy the West had once been so fervent in forcing upon Libya looks more like a medieval rule, says director of the Cairo-based Java Center for Political Studies, Rifayat Saeed Ahmed. With all the troubles in the country, it seems the most active institution in the country will be the Supreme Agency for Standards of Integrity and Nationalism, which examines the past of every government official to get rid of the Gaddafi people. The agency peruses thousands of documents every day, and every few days it publishes a list of people who may not work for the government. These include journalists, writers, former ambassadors, consultants, and thousands of other officials, including those who took part in the Gaddafi's revolution of 1969, people who could help the new government run the country. Court upholds death sentences for seven Christians involved in Mohammed video. Since Obama has repeatedly condemned this video, don't expect him to stand up for the freedom of speech or say a word about this new advance of Sharia in glorious Arab Spring in Egypt. A Cairo tribunal on Tuesday upheld death sentences passed on seven Egyptian Coptic Christians in absentia for their involvement in a movie that ridiculed the Prophet Muhammad, a judicial source said. The accused, including the director of the movie that triggered outrage across the Muslim world when it surfaced last September, are currently living in the United States. Terry Jones, an American pastor based in Florida, who is said to have promoted the film and who had also been sentenced to death in absentia, had his sentence reduced to five years in jail by the tribunal. Egyptian courts usually hand out the maximum punishment, execution in this case for a blasphemy verdict, and send the decision to the state's top Islamic scholar to get his approval. Today's confirmation of the sentences occurred after his opinions were taken. This is a society preparing for war. Guns and ammo production maxed out. President Barack Obama is, arguably, the best gun salesman ever. Over 65 million guns have been purchased since the President took office in 2009. FBI background check statistics indicate that, over the last 12 months, Americans purchased a new gun every 1.5 seconds, a figure which suggests there is much more to the recent panic buying than people just stocking up to go hunting or sports shooting. A guns and ammo industry report indicates that every major gun and ammunition manufacturer in the country is running at 100% capacity, with many so far behind that they've stopped taking new orders altogether. 
In a related story from the USA, natural rights and Second Amendment are racist. You know establishment liberals are desperate when they start throwing around the race card to defend their attacks on the American Constitution and its Bill of Rights. Last week, that's exactly what former Washington DC cop and MSNBC scriptwriter Chris Matthews did. He called the NRA's National Rifle Association, O. Wayne LaPierre, a racist for daring to defend the God-given natural right of self-defense. Unfortunately, the NRA boss discounted the primary reason there is a Second Amendment and safely framed his argument within parameters defined by the state. Gun owners are not buying firearms because they anticipate a confrontation with the government. Rather, we anticipate confrontations where the government isn't there or simply doesn't show up in time, he wrote. In fact, many Americans are buying guns fully expecting to one day fight government tyranny. As Andrew Napolitano has pointed out, the Second Amendment was written to protect the right to shoot tyrants, not skeet shoot, a reference to Obama's ridiculous claim, supposedly backed up by a photo, that he likes to go to Camp David and skeet shoot. Thought for the day. Why can't we become more nationalistic? For once, I'm stepping off the emotive stone about immigration and standing on the practical stone. We, as a country and people, need to start thinking in a different way. Why? Because even if you are a liberal, anti-racist, all-encompassing moron who thinks that by accepting and encouraging all and sundry into this country, you are doing yourself a favour mentally. Or perhaps you are thinking of the Egyptian god who will weigh your heart against a feather and find you wanting. So fear of the next world, if you believe in it, might come into play. However, the cold hard facts of the matter are that if we continue to take in the same numbers we've been taking in for over 20 years, never deporting illegals or criminals, and continue to pay out vast sums of money for the privilege of doing so, something will have to give. Even people who have hearts as big as their purse strings must see the numbers will never fit the country, and something, or most things we treasure or used to in England, will vanish. First imports. From being a fairly self-sufficient country at the end of the last war, we now have become the biggest importers of staple foods and goods for the landmass size in Europe. I'm going to read an article written by David Archibald in the UK Growing Season. UK Growing Season, posted February the 11th. Guest post by David Archibald. Next week I'm hosting a dinner party at which a fellow of the Royal Society will be guest of honour. One of the gang of four who got the Society to tone down their position of global warming alarmism. So it is ap apposite to consider the outlook for energy and food supply in the UK. Peak coal production in that country was 100 years ago at 292 million tonnes. The UK's peak oil production was in 1999, with production continuing to fall rapidly. The UK is now importing almost all of its fossil fuel requirements. It decided to switch to relying upon wind power, but recently found that turbines were lasting about half as long as the wind industry said they would. The Climate Change Act, effectively de-industrialising the country, was passed in the House of Commons in October 2008 by 463 votes to three. Even as snow was falling outside. The winters since that act were passed in 2008 have been particularly bitter, but that's only a taste of what is to come. The UK imports 40% of its food requirements, but is still accepting immigrants, while having a high unemployment rate of 7.8%. With respect to the 60% of the food requirement grown in the country, the length of the thermal growing season for crops has been calculated back to 1772. The longest growing season in the 241 years back to 1772 was 300 days in 2000. The average growing season in the mid-19th century was 240 days, with the shortest growing season being just 181 days in 1859. The world is returning to the climate of the mid-19th century as a best-case outcome, as will the UK. End of quote. So with more immigrants, whether they work or not, food will become more expensive and less available, as will just about every other service we used to enjoy. Our countryside and land will suffer. Already we have the immigrant lovies in the name of Camoran wanting more people from the Indian subcontinent, and if you look at what these self-same Indians have done to India, you don't want the same over here. Vince Cable wants more Chinese over here. He must really like his takeaways. Whole estates of cheap, affordable housing, for immigrants only, will be built on arable or even greenfield land. More roads and more airports to bring them in, 
and in no time at all, we will not have a recognisable United Kingdom any more. This is not scaremongering, it is a fact. Even the gentle approach from Migration Watch is avoiding the true figures of foreigners we have already taken in, and the rapidity in which whole areas of previously indigenous peoples are now almost totally foreign. Now, it's a well-known fact, but of course little published, that many of these migrants come from countries that operate a non-immigration policy. So even if we wanted, we can't do to them what is being done to us. A friend of the party has just returned from Japan. What an eye-opener that's been. Now, I personally know the cruelty the Japanese meted out to the civilians in Malaya during the last war, and I abhor cruelty in any form. But you have to give them credit that they have never apologised or grovelled. Why? Because in Japanese culture, anyone who allows themselves to be caught while fighting is deemed a coward, and civilians simply don't count if not Japanese. Now, whilst this is an alien thing to me, you have to admit they are the true nationalists of the world. Not so much the Chinese or Korean communists, as they will kill their own if they don't share the same mantra, but the Japanese do look after their own first. Foreigners who work over there do so in the light of being called foreigners to their face, and merely tolerated as long as they work. I applaud this system, because it not only discourages foreigners from staying in Japan, but solves the problem of Japanese jobs for Japanese people. They are openly racist and proud of it, and their country, also to be applauded. It was seen that nationalism, taken to what we English would call extreme, works. There isn't an immigration problem in Japan. They do have foreigners there, but they don't seek to occupy vast swathes of land, build their own temples or mosques, and seek to convert the native Japanese. All signs and languages spoken in Japan, I believe, is Japanese. The people on their televisions are Japanese. The houses are Japanese, as indeed are nearly all the people in the streets. Theirs is not a cosmopolitan society. They like it the way it is. Indeed, if I were Japanese, I'd love it. Unfortunately, I love England. Some of its people leave a lot to be desired, but all in all, I would like to see society more along the lines of Japan over here than what we are being expected to put up with, especially in the future. The idea of an NHS being so undermined and weary it stops operating for the people it was designed to help appalls me. The idea we may have to fight for food against foreigners who should not be here in the first place appalls me. The fact that our education system is so corrupted by foreigners and the idea of multiculturalism that our own children are propagandised against their own country appalls me. The image of multiple roads, estates, mosques and huge supermarkets appalls me. The future where no one can question or fight for what is right appalls me. The fact disease strangers can come into the UK and immediately receive thousands of pounds worth of medical treatment when our own are ignored appalls me. Our own vanishing race and culture, sinking quietly and swiftly to its doom, appalls me. The fact that our future as a race or our history depends on a precious few, us nationalists, appalls me. The whole country should be made aware of what is going to happen, not what could happen in the not-so-distant future. Certainly not given some rosy-tinted view of minarets, love and peace, multi-hued happy people, food in abundance, medical care free and available to all, education turning out little Marxist robots who will go to uni to become bigger Marxist robots or Islamist fascists, wonderful global economies and no wars. Wake up, people. This view was aired in the 1960s in certain films, and it should have come to pass, if it was going to come to pass, 20 years ago, according to those fools. We all need to become more nationalistic. It isn't racist to love your country, and it isn't racist to know what can and will happen if we keep taking in huge numbers of different races and cultures and religions into this small island. Nothing can go on forever, and where the Japanese have been clever, is the fact they have never pushed a multicultural society on their own people. They have remained self-sufficient to a large degree. They sell globally, and Japanese goods are way better than their Chinese counterparts. They have retained their own culture and religion, and it is compulsory in Japanese schools that Japanese history is taught, not the history of the world. They take the Western inventions and make them their own, not adapt an entire generation of their children in the ways of the foreigner. Their kids play with Xboxes, computers, mobiles, you name it, 
but they never lose sight of the fact they are Japanese and they don't want to be anything else. If that had been done in England with the English schools, we wouldn't have an entire generation in government now who are practically thinking well outside the box and indeed, I believe, are either in the pockets of Islam or just plain balmy. Surely they can see the countries that most of our migrants come from are being torn apart either by religion or race, not by our armed forces or the US. They are doing this to themselves because they know they can come to the UK and be looked after, fed, watered, given money and homes. Where else in the world today can anyone expect that if you simply land in a foreign country thousands of miles away? I'm going to read a comment from our traveller to Japan that I received today and it is very interesting how different cultures treat foreigners. In today's Telegraph, the China Daily Supplement, there's a report on how China has introduced a 72-hour visa waiver system at Beijing Airport so that tourists from 45 countries may stay in the capital three days without a visa. There is then a photo showing a Chinese-Australian at the counter, Australian citizen Zhu Wei, waits at the 72-hour visa waiver counter at Beijing Airport, and I think it likely that they'll be taking a photo and fingerprints so they can check them all in and check them all out. It would never work in this country under present circumstances. However, if all the alien population, regardless of place of birth which is an irrelevance, were properly registered and issued with an official ID card with all their details, such as an agreed date of departure, such a system could be permitted and genuine visitors could be made welcome once we know that they were no longer attempting to invade and take over our country. If only the discussion could be moved on to the removal of illegals and repatriation, the debate would then be moving in the right direction. In my view, Japan is a model of how the issue of foreigners should be dealt with. For instance, they come in under sufferance and they have to behave themselves, with no nonsense tolerated and no question of aliens getting on their high horse and making racist demands, as they have been allowed to do in this country and throughout Europe, though not in Russia, I believe. Just been reported on Radio 4 about an hour ago that a Costa Coffee branch in Nottingham advertised for five workers and 1,700 applied. Under these circumstances, and with the government stating that more jobs are desperately needed, it's criminal for them to still be letting more immigrants into the country. In fact, it is obvious that priority with job offers should go to British workers, and I mean British, and that there are strong grounds for encouraging the departure of others. End of letter. We need to wake up, realise what's going to happen, and stop burying our heads in the sand, except for a few well-worn and outdated statements that everyone who is vaguely nationalistic in their views is either an idiot or a racist thug. England might depend on those idiots or racist thugs one day. And finally, shall I go or shall I stay? Public lavatories to become gender neutral. Brighton and Hove City Council has scrapped male and female public lavatories in favour of gender neutral facilities so as not to alienate the transgender community. I am reading this, it is true. A public lavatory block is to become gender neutral. The move was described as political correctness gone balmy by opponents who warned that the vast majority would prefer to use single-sex loos. Brighton and Hove City Council disclosed in emails that it wished to promote the term gender neutral and build facilities which are open to all, regardless of sex. They believe such facilities will be more accessible for those who do not identify with the male-female binary. The block will include four new lavatories and a cafe. Images de depicting a man, a woman and a child will be fitted to the doors. Linda Hyde, a Tory councillor in the Rottingdean ward in which the new facility is being built, said, This does seem to be a case of unnecessary bureaucracy and political correctness. A city council spokeswoman declined to comment on the decision to promote term gender neutral. She said, When producing signs for public toilets in the city, we use standard images rather than words. This is particularly beneficial to the many tourists from overseas visiting our city. The lesbian, gay and transgender population in Brighton is estimated to be around 40,000. In a 2006 survey of the community, around 5% of respondents identified themselves as transgender. This presenter has several comments, some of which are repeatable. I spent a large part of my teen years in Hove and it was a lovely town then. 
Nowadays, it just isn't the place I knew. As the transgender bogs, the mind boggleth. First, this council wants to lovey up to the transgender or transsexual or trans-something persona, and then the foreign versions of such. As for the pickies donating men, women and child on doors, I think my listeners' minds and mine are at one on this one. Sounds like an invitation to a rather odd Roman or orgy. I, for one, do not want to share a bog with someone who not only has his own bits but mine as well. In fact, in the words of our foreign correspondent, they can all bugger off. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I wish you all a very good night.